Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're investigating where Hawaii's fish come from with Dr. Brian Bowen's research team at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology on Coconut Island. Brian's team has just returned from a trip to Karas Mas, a remote coral atoll 1,000 miles south of Oahu that is also known as Christmas Island. While at Karas Mas, Bowen's team gathered genetic samples from local fish to compare with Hawaii fish. The relationships in DNA that they discover will tell us about the resiliency of our own local fish populations and reveal secrets of the historical migration of reef fish across Oceania. We start off talking with researcher Michael Hoban. So you just got back from Christmas Island. Yes, that's like nowhere I've ever been. Tell me a little bit about the island. So it's a, it's a atoll, just like a, basically it used to be a high island, but it's subsided and so now it's flat. I don't think any part of the island is more than four or five feet above sea level. Turns out it's the largest atoll in the world by landmass at any rate, which I didn't know before going there, um, which is really cool. It's, it's about two degrees above the equator, I think, in the northern hemisphere. There's a large lagoon in the middle and then the outside there's fringing reefs all the way around that kind of slope down into the abyss. So there's some interesting things to see when you're out there diving. And yeah, it was just great. It's historically not inhabited. So it has like, there's some evidence of Polynesians having stopped over there, you know, in the 14th century between Tahiti and Hawaii. Uh -huh. But nobody has, there's no real permanent settlement there until the late 19th century uh, it had changed colonial hands several times, and then a Frenchman leased the island to plant coconuts, and he planted coconut palms all over the whole thing, and then imported a bunch of people from the Gilbert Islands uh, in the Western Pacific to basically man maintain the coconut plantation and to produce copra, which is dried coconut meat for oil. And so these people from the country that's now known as Kiribati were brought over there and have essentially stayed there ever since. And they're a culture that, Kiribati is a series of atolls as well, so it wasn't a big shock for them to live there. So it's sort of just, a, it's sort of this eastern, far eastern outpost of the nation of Kiribati. I think that country, technically, based on how far spread the islands are, has the most area that the country encompasses. But in terms of, in terms of actual land area, it's the smallest, because it's these tiny little islets that are part of you know, that are separated by vast stretches of Pacific Ocean. How do they get fresh water there if there's no high island? They have trouble with fresh water there. I know that, you know, when it rains, you get, essentially it's called a freshwater lens. So you have a water that sits on top of the salt water uh, on these atolls, but they don't have a lot of soil. It's mostly this kind of broken uh, ancient coral. So water does soak through. They do, they have wells, some wells, uh, mostly rainwater catchment, and I think they actually ship in some water sometimes because they'll go through drought periods periodically. So it's, it's touch and go. And then also, of course, with climate change, because they're so close to sea level, as you get more sea level rise and you get more frequent king tides and stuff like that, it inundates the freshwater supply. And so there's not a lot of room for growing much there aside from coconuts. How was um, the underwater habitat there? It was really beautiful, but also kind of sad. Uh, so the reefs are almost entirely dead right now there. Uh, but they died so recently that they still have all of their complex structure. Uh, so it's these, you know, amazing big complex coral reefs, but it's sadly all dead coral. The, the flip side of that is that there's still a ton of fish. It kind of shows you that the things that we think of as coral reef fish don't necessarily need coral, they just need reef. Um, and so, but there are signs that it's recovering. And so if we, if they get a few years without another nasty El Nino, which is what hit them in the first place, I think that they'll, their reefs will come back. Cause there's a lot of the signs that you see of, you know, you see baby corals growing and there's a kind of algae that grows over things that is good for corals. And there's a lot of that kind of algae. There's a lot of big upright algae, which is not necessarily good, but there's tons and tons of herbivorous fishes, which tend to eat that stuff. So it's not, like it's sad to look at, but I don't think it's a hopeless cause. But they're very close to the equator, so anytime they get hit by any kind of thermal anomaly, hot 
temperatures over time, they get it the worst. And they're right in the path of that hot water that sloshes across the Pacific for El Ninos. And so that's what happened to them. They got, they had a warmer than average year and then El Nino hit. So it just made the surface water temperature be extremely warm for nine or 10 months or something like that. And so and this was all in 2015 that that happened. But otherwise, yeah, it was beautiful. And there's, you know, things that you don't see here as often, big milkfish and big trevallies and tons of manta rays. There's fewer people, so you see more fish basically. You know, in Hawaii, you don't, especially on Oahu, you just don't see a lot of that stuff because it's fished out. So it's, it's cool to see. Can you tell me your favorite part of working on this type of project? I, well, I like going into the field, <laughs> which is probably why most of us got into doing this, right? We like to go diving. We like to look at fish and that kind of stuff. So I, I love that part of it for sure. Um, I think in terms of the whole picture, when you see something unexpected or you see something that very closely lines up to what you did expect, right? If you're right about, you know, <laughs> that's always a good feeling. But then there's also, you know, one of the things that I have going with one of my projects is I study, I'm studying these little fish called blennies um, that are these adorable little things that sit on coral reefs and, and they have a little things, <laughs> yep, and they have a big smile on their faces, you know. But they, uh, they're distributed very broadly across the Pacific, this one species, but when I, looked at the gen genetics of them, one group of them grouped out way over here, um, despite them all being nominally the same species. And that group was from the Marquesas Islands, which, like Hawaii, many of the species in the Marquesas occur nowhere else. And sometimes what you get in those situations is you get uh, a species that will diverge genetically, but not obviously to look at. So it'll look like the same species, but it'll end up being something very different. And so I think, I'm still working through the details of that, but I think we call that a cryptic species. And so I think what I have is a cryptic species of this blenny that occurs in the Marquesas. So that was really cool to see. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. Welcome back. We're talking about the genetic connections between fish populations in Karis Moss and Hawaii with researcher Joshua Kopis. To me, the Christmas Island Hawaii connection is, is um, interesting because I'm looking at whether or not sea level has an, um, any effect on the genetic signal we see between the locations and whether or not that's different than the shallow coral reef fishes. My dissertation really focuses on um, what we call mesophotic fishes, which are fishes that live fairly deep, below 30 to 40 meters, where light starts to get filtered out in the, in the water down to you know, 100 plus meters, depending on where you're at. Um, the bottom of the mesophotic is where the light pretty much disappears. So I do a lot of technical diving to get down to those depths and study those fishes. When you get down to 80 meters or more, you start to find a really unique community of fish that are related to the shallow coral reef fishes, but are definitely different species. And, and we're actually finding quite a few new species of fish on those reefs. Everywhere we go, we tend to come back with a half a dozen new species. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Sea level changes um, at, at approximately a 100,000 year cycle at approximately a 100 meter amplitude. And so when the sea level drops 100 meters, much of the shallow reef is gone, it's dry land. And so, but, but the fishes that can live below that may not be impacted and you may see a different genetic signature. So you're looking at really long term relationships if you're going back a thousand years and looking at past glacial periods? Well, I, I, yeah, I really am looking at the last 
glacial period, and, and really um, that's a very short amount of time in in the scheme of, of relation, species relationships. Glacial cycles currently operate on a about a hundred thousand year cycle where the sea level drops during the glacial, glacials when, when, when we're in an ice age and as the ice melts and the sea level rises the bathymetry or the habitat changes. The um, amount of um, available habitat for shallow reef fishes increases as the sea level rises. So the sea levels, we're, we're at the top of one of those cycles. Sea level is now higher than it's actually been for quite a while due to other factors like global warming. And it's possible that the connection between Christmas Island and Hawaii might actually be more obtainable at the lower sea level where the sea levels are 100 meters lower and some of those seamounts that are now in too deep a water f to, to support any of the coral reef fishes or invertebrates might actually be accessible to them during the LGM or as sea level drops. So that might provide more stepping stones in, into Hawaii than we currently have. So when we sort of look at our Pacific Ocean Basin now, we don't see all of the stepping stones that might historically have been there. Possibly, that's yes. That's really cool. And that's, um, that's part of what I hope to resolve in, in my dissertation. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Welcome back. We're talking with Expedition Collection Leader Derek Kraft. Derek is not your average spearfisher. Most people spearfish for food, but Derek spears to collect samples for DNA analysis, often searching for very small, hard to see, and hard to catch fishes. What is your role in organizing or being part of this expedition to Kiribati? I was, I am a research assistant actually under my lab mate Richard, and I handle the field side of most of this research, so I'm actually out collecting fish on a weekly basis. I kind of feel a little bit more in charge of a lot of the equipment, so the spears and the bags and the actual uh, logistics of operating what we kind of do day to day. So making sure the spears are sharp, making sure we have vials, and making sure all of our stuff shows up. How many dives do you think you went on while you were there? We did 12 in five days. How many specimens did you guys collect? Probably about over 800. Across a spectrum of fish, invertebrates. Yep, we got corals. fish, corals, we got calories, snails. On the first day alone, I think we got about 280 fish. This is our field shed. Hiding up here are some of our utensils. This is a pretty standard pole spear, Hawaiian slings, three prong. Just pull the bands forward, and that's loading it. And then if, if I let go of the spear, it'll, the band will fling the, swing, the spear forward. Right, and you guys are trying to hit sometimes but really, pretty small fish. Sometimes they're about this big. And when they're this big, hopefully they're in schools, and then you kind of shoot at the school. And so, you're gonna spear the fish, and then what do you do with it? Um, you'll have a collection bag with you. This is a fine collection bag here. If you spear a fish, if it's up against something, like a rock or in the sand, uh, that's handy, because then it can't get off the spear, and you'll swim down with your net, pull the spear up, put it right inside the net, close it, and then that's how you get the spear off and now it's in your bag. What are some of the concerns that you have, say prepping for a trip, making sure all the gear is gonna get there? Making sure it all gets there straight. Like these can bend pretty easy and get bent while traveling. Making sure we have enough extra bands is important. These bands will break all the time. We'll usually carry a couple on each dive. Making sure we have extra tips, making sure we have files to sharpen them. 
uh, and making sure we don't poke each other while we do it. Right. <laughs> most, most of the times anybody gets poked, it's on land when people are getting ready, not paying attention, and then poke their buddy. And then what kind of a solution do you put the fish clips in, the fin clips mm -hmm. in to preserve them? It's DMSO, which is a salt buffer. Uh -huh. So the tissue can go in there and it, uh, it'll preserve it, and, or we could use ethanol, alcohol. So sort of like pickling something, I guess. Sure. Or, um... Yeah, but it's a solution that's safe and it'll keep the DNA intact. It's been a real treat to be able to go out into the water a couple times a week or once a week at least. Uh, for a lot of people, the field work is, you know, the kind of the, the fun part and the nice part. You got to go out, you got to go free diving, you got to go scuba diving, you got to go out on the boat. And to be able to do that part of the work, you know, for most of my job is what I'm supposed to do is, is a real treat. I get to know the reef really well. I get to know my specimens really well, um, how they swim, where they're at how to find them, who's going to be where, depending on what fish we're looking for that day. So to kind of get that more naturalist knowledge uh, out on the reef, I think is a, is a treat. What are some of the trickier types of fish to get? Small ones. <laughs> the small ones, the chromis, we had a really uh, hard time with. Luckily, they're in schools, and they'll kind of hang out just above all the reef. And so you shoot at the outside of the schools to get them to compact a little bit more, and then as you shoot, you just hopefully get one. I remember I would inhale, load the spear, shoot, exhale. Inhale, load the spear, shoot, exhale, and just by luck of the draw, you hit a few. Next, we're talking with researcher Richard Coleman about the link between Karis moss fish and Hawaii fish. How does the Christmas Island connectivity work fit into your personal research for your degree? So just a general idea of looking at connectivity across the Pacific, uh -huh. um, and particularly its location or the relativeness to Hawaii. Christmas Island is one of those locations that's really informative to looking at how genetic connectivity could go in and out of Hawaii and how Hawaii is r related to the, to the rest of the Pacific. Why do you personally find that question interesting? There's multiple reasons. One is just basic evolutionary biology, looking at where species evolved from. I think in particular for Hawaii because it's the, one of the most isolated areas on the planet. So understanding how fish have arrived here, where they came from. None of the fish in Hawaii originated there. It's a volcanic island, so it arose in the middle of the Pacific. So all the species that ended up there had to have come from somewhere. Just from an evolutionary standpoint, that's an interesting question for me, is how did the species end up there? Yeah, we could, you know, it's something that our lab have, heavily does. We have samples from across the Pacific, so we can integrate data that we have from around the Pacific and, in, and use that to inform patterns of dispersal or migration to Hawaii, out of Hawaii, looking at where things originated from. And then where do you go from here? You're sort of building these skills, building this body of knowledge, and what is your next step? I would ultimately want to use these type of techniques to inform conservation. For conservation, it's important to understand where our food resources come from. So the species that I'm working on are targeted specifically by recreational fishers. So the ones that, you know, you go out to the beach, you see all the guys with the spear, spears coming out, or, you know, the reels. So those are the, the species that I'm interested in. Can you tell me what kind of species those are? Yeah, so I'm looking at Manini, mm -hmm. so Ancantheris triastegus, and Cole, just is the strigosis. And Cole is endemic to Hawaii. And that's the brown surgeon fish with the yellow ring around the eye, and Manini is a convict tang. Mm -hmm. So they're really common, and they're heavily fished by recreational fishers, and particularly in the main Hawaiian Islands, when, at least from my travels, when I visit other areas, it's very apparent that the populations of Manini are heavily impacted on Oahu in particular. Next, we're talking with researcher Charlie Westbrook to get his insights on traveling to Kerismas with the Bowen research team. I understand that you were also part of this recent expedition to Christmas Island uh, with researchers from the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology trying to understand how fishes are related across the Pacific and how do we get the populations we have here in Hawaii. 
What was your role in that expedition? First of all, I was like super stoked to be a part of that expedition at all because I was, I was just, I didn't expect to be invited. So that was awesome. From a field logistics perspective, I was just kind of um, just assisting, making sure that we had everything we needed on the boat, making sure the spears were there, making sure that everyone had tanks and whatnot. But yeah, I was just really kind of working in a, and I guess an, an assistant manner. And for me, it's just a really cool, I guess, opportunity to get that field experience because otherwise it's it's really difficult sometimes to get to go out to these very distant remote locations and so it was a really cool opportunity for me to go out and, and kind of do a project that's outside of what I usually focus on and work with fish and stuff like that. And do you think those type of experiences will help you to grow into a more well-rounded researcher? Sure yeah I mean it, it'll definitely broaden um, my experience and just um, give me a new appreciation, I think, for, for those types of projects. I learned a lot of fish names that I, I never knew before. I learned a lot of different species and just how you, you learn a lot about the fish's behavior when you spend so many hours in the water and, and you know what you're looking for and the different color morphs of different species. And so it's, it's something that I, I just kind of took for granted before. Like a lot of times you go diving, you just see like these clouds of fish everywhere. And you're like, oh, that's nice. And you just kind of keep swimming and it's just like, <laughs> When you're looking for a specific species, you start to determine what the c communities are comprised of and you just gain a whole new appreciation for it. And it, it was just really cool. Honestly, for me, it one of my favorite parts of the trip was really just that first dive that we did jumping in the water. I didn't know what to expect because the only places I've ever dove were the Mediterranean and here. And, uh, and the Mediterranean where I, where I was, the fish um, diversity wasn't that great. Here in Hawaii, it's, it's the most I've ever seen. So to me, this was like the pinnacle. I was like, wow, this is, this is crazy. But then going to Christmas and getting in the water and just seeing these masses of fish, it was just like, whoa, like I was just mind blown. Um, and just seeing a lot of large fish, uh, large diversities, and just huge abundance of, of different types of fish was just really cool. Um, seeing the big milk fish at the surface that were just cruising around, and the jacks, and the barracudas that we'd run into, and these. There's this one point, I remember we were, we were starting to surface and this big school of barracuda just came out of nowhere and it just kind of like split in half and just swam around us and it was just like, whoa, like this is the stuff you hear about and like you see in documentaries and just getting to experience that was, was really unique and, and special, I think, for me. And it just kind of like rekindles that flame, I think, inside of like why you do research is like this is what you're trying to protect, like this is what you want to see um, kind of passed on to the next generation. What about that companion element? So you, you didn't go by yourself. You got to go with this really amazing group of our, researchers. Yeah, our team was was amazing. Like, honestly, I would follow those guys in a battle. Like, they were, they were great. And it was just being with a group where everyone is so autonomous but also willing to help each other was just really cool. When you're underwater, you're very dependent on your buddy and stuff like that. And so whether it's like holding this or helping them with their gear or something like that, it's like you're really dependent on that person. The buddy was always there for you too. So it was like there was never a point where you turn around and you're like, oh my gosh, look at, what do I do? And it's like, no, they're right there with you. So it's, it's, it is a very cool experience. It was a very, I think, important team building exercise um, for the lab, honestly. And I think it would have been cool if we could have done it years ago when I first joined the lab because you just learn so much about each individual and how they'll react to different situations. And it's very cool. Yeah, very lucky to have been a part of it. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is a dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. Teaching ocean science concepts through the disciplines of physics, chemistry, biology, and ecology. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now available freely online. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org.